here the differentiation between benign and malign, the accuracy of contrast in ultrasound was quite 90%. Per, 90%. And for a specific lesion, we have 81.4 uh, accuracy. Then we can say this hemangioma or FNH or uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or metastasis. Then have in mind 90% for benign malign and 82% for uh, the specific diagnosis. You, you can have here, the, the sensitivity was higher for a benign lesion than for malign lesion, but accuracy is quite the same, 90%. But what is important maybe in this uh, cartoon to see a little which are the easy diagnosis and which are more difficult diagnosis. And difficult diagnosis are cholangiocarcinoma and adenoma. And here the accuracy is only 50-60%. But for metastasis 90, hemangioma 90, FNH 85. Then this is uh, when we send first uh, this patient. When it's unclear diagnosis, we send immediately to the uh, second line imaging method. Uh, here it's interesting uh, meta analysis. They look to a comparison between contrast and ultrasound CT and MRI. Why I discuss you, with you about this? Because uh, we have in mind that medicine is very costly. And then we try to decrease, if it's possible, the cost of the, the medicine. And uh, if we look to the price of contrast ultrasound, then it's five times or more than five times cheaper than uh, MRI or uh, CT scan. Then for this, no radiation, no uh, claustrophobia for patient MRI and five minutes diagnosis. And in this meta-analysis, if you look to sensitive and specificity for contrast, Look here, 87, 89, CT, 86, XT, 82, MRI, 85, 87. They are quite to the same level of sensitivity and specificity. And we must have in mind when we send the patient further. Okay, in the last five years, we have so called COS LIRADS. Then come from radiology that they use first in, uh, in uh, MRI to... to increase the accuracy of uh, diagnosis of ACC and finally what we like to avoid if it's possible a number of CT or uh, contrast in MRI. Why? Because no waiting time, no stress for patient, no radiation and some studies uh, say us that gadolinium can have a, cere a cerebral toxicity because we believe uh, MRI is safe but this uh, cerebral toxicity can be in on long time a problem for uh, for the patient and uh, we have uh, not only contrast we can use sometimes only simple doppler that can give us some information especially if we uh, see very well arterial uh, the artery inside the fnh or we can have some special uh, distribution of arterial supply in uh, acc then with this multi-parametric ultrasound we try to make our best finally to give a final diagnosis in patient uh, with focal liver lesion. Now to go a little to diffuse uh, liver disease. Uh, in my experience, I have more than 4,000 liver biopsy. Any patient was uh, happy when I proposed him to perform a liver biopsy. And I believe him, many of them, they hate me for this invasive procedure. We say it's very simple for a doctor, it's very simple, but for the patient, it's very stressful to have a, a biopsy. Okay, then I was, the first day I was very happy because we have in our hand this non-invasive modality for evaluation of patient with chronic liver diseases. And what we can have from in chronic liver diseases, see parameters that we can obtain. Evaluation of fibrosis, evaluation of steatosis, and evaluation, more recent evaluation of inflammation. And this is important for, uh, for uh, this entity that is non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases. Why you need to have uh, this non-invasive method? Because in this moment, a, a huge cohort of patients are at risk to develop uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases. This is more than un, 1 billion people that need to have a, an evaluation. Then how to perform more than 1 billion of liver biopsy? We have a lot of obese people, we have diabetic, we have the metabolic uh, disease patient, then we have a lot of them. And 
With ultrasound method, we can have a final diagnosis of this parameter that we like to obtain by liver biopsy in 5-7 minutes. Okay. Then it's, if we look here to the prevalence of NAFLD in the world, in developed world, it's around one quarter of the population. Then we can start with this, uh, this uh, evaluation of fibrosis because fibrosis gives the prognosis. These are the, uh, you, you learn about this in uh, Vito Cantisani and Adia Saptoi presentation. So keep in mind we have three methods, transient elastography of fibroscan point and 2D. Uh, okay. And uh, these are shear wave elastography, so called, that we use for the liver. And these are very simple because the probe produces uh, uh, the waves. No, any pressure is necessary. We can have the results in kilopascal in Europe or meter per second in America. Then examination learning uh, procedure is quite simple because you can be trained after 50 examination. But for 2D, some experience in field of ultrasound is unnecessary because uh, you must know exactly where to put your box uh, for this evaluation. And the feasibility of the liver elastography is very good. More than 90% uh, of cases we have diagnosis. We have a lot of guidelines, European and the World uh, Federation guidelines that uh, say us how to make this evaluation. These are inside the, our ultrasound machine that is very good. It's ne not necessary to buy a new machine. And uh, we have some uh, cut of value that are specific in this moment. This point box, you, you find the right liver, intercostal way. Then we put the, our box here, push the button, and we have results. I like a lot this point of, uh, this point share of elastography because it's very, very simple. I say that I can train you uh, in five minutes to make this evaluation. Some meta analysis about the value, quite uh, 4,000 patients. Look here to the Aurox, that 084 to 091. These uh, are very good accuracy and these in, are increasing with the severity of fibrosis. Then is the second method that is 2D, color coded and numeric one. We, we find the liver, a very good image of the liver. We put the box inside, we put this ROI, push the button and we have result. And if we look here to the value of uh, this 2D share of elastography, these are very, very high. For C virus, B virus, or NAFLD, look here, these are around 85 90 for uh, uh, significant fibrosis, increasing to 95 in a patient with uh, cirrhosis. But what is more recent, what is development in the life last uh, three, four years, is quantification of steatosis, this is called QS, okay? and evaluation of fibrosis. This is very well known by patient and doctor. This fibroscan then give us here in, in yellow liver stiffness, fibrosis, and give in the same time the severity of, uh, of steatosis using control attenuation parameter. There are some cut of uh, value to remember this because from my point of view are the best come from an uh, English paper. That is 290, 310, and 330 decibel per meter for moderate, for mild, moderate, and severe steatosis. And this value in affluent patients are different from the ACB or HBV. Then keep in mind this value for you practice if you receive a, a result. Then we, we are now happy because now we have this module not in fibroscan that it's an expensive machine, but we have in our ultrasound machine modality of quantification, we perform ultrasound, liver seem to be steatosic, we put uh, the, the box and we obtain immediately the value of steatosis, the severity of steatosis by a numeric value, and we can uh, follow then later on this patient for this uh, parameter. And the uh, uh, steatosis quantification from this system, we can have this, this uh, UGAP from General Electric, ATT from Hitachi, ATI, ATI from uh, Canon, but now quite all big machine have inside the uh, modality of evaluation. And uh, if you buy a good machine, you have always this module inside the machine. But finally, we go to the multiparametric ultrasound. One means that we have more inside than fibrosis and the steatosis. We can make evaluation of inflammation. Uh, we can look to viscoelastic property. This is more recent, one or two years. Uh, on the market and now there are a lot of research 
to find exactly the place of uh, this uh, modality. And this is a, a paper that was published two, two years ago. Uh, and uh, they look with the ultrasound machine to uh, all these three parameters. And if we look here for, for inflammation, uh, looking to dispersion slope, they have an uh, AUROC of 0 0.95 for uh, mild inflammation, going to 0 0.85 for uh, severe inflammation, then good result for uh, attenuation, then for steatosis, and sure for uh, liver kidneys, we know that are very good. And finally, if uh, they combine all these three parameters, they can have uh, the diagnosis of uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, then, then the severe disease with an accuracy of 0.81, then it's very, very good for practice. Then fighting with the liver biopsy, and I am very sure this would be the right direction for, uh, for uh, this uh, modality of evaluation. Uh, Alina Popescu, my co-worker, uh, wrote a paper, then uh, multiparameter sound give the multiphase of, uh, of uh, ultrasonography. Very good news for you. Now it's working to a machine. This is very recent on the in presentation. Now European Congress of Hepatology. They work to a probe, only the probe. You use your computer and you can make this hepatoscope. You can make elastography with this probe. You take the probe, put the liver on the on the patient and push the button and you receive the information in you in uh, your laptop of uh, tab and you have the severity of steatosis uh, of uh, fibrosis then it's a uh, very good for practice on the other hand in the same direc uh, direction now uh, the many uh, company have inside their middle class machine module for fibrosis and for steatosis quantification in my practice i work a lot with this all the patients that come in my office with some problem in the liver, I perform immediately quantification of steatosis and quantification of fibrosis, not using the very, very expensive and very, very high-tech machine. Middle class, this is very important. And my dream is then in less than five years, the GP can have in their own office such machine for this evaluation because there is the real uh, screening. I don't make a screening because the patient come to me because are sent by you, but you must uh, screen the population and then to send to the specialist. And I'm very sure in, that are, we are in a good way here. Okay, then in this moment, I, I hope that I convince you Then in field of the liver, not hepatology, we have multiparametric ultrasound, don't matter that it's a focal liver lesion or it's a diffuse one. And we must have good machine, not the, like my first machine, very, very old machine, and we must be trained, and it's our duty to train you to, to make a good job for, uh, for your patient to have uh, quite easy the final diagnos diagnosis. Thank you very much. If you have question, yes, please.
प्लीज हेलो प्रोफेसर क्रिस्टियन यासन इट्स इट्स अ रियल प्लेजर फॉर अस टू बी टुगेदर इन कनेक्शन बिटवीन वियना एंड बर्लिन एंड आल्सो वी थैंक यू बिकॉज यू विल बी टुगेदर विथ अस इन द इवनिंग थैंक यू एंड नाउ आई प्रेजेंट professor christian jansen who is the president of the european federation of ultrasonography in mind design and biology and uh, he is the second keynote speaker together with professor shlomo winker thank you christian you are welcome in vienna now and the main and he told that and he teaches that ultrasound should be the continuation of clinical examination by technical means no sound completely activated mm. Okay. So then it's okay now I have information that you can hear me sorry for delay and um now I continue with my presentation um Gerd Rettenmeier a German gastroenterologist uh, in 1976 
uh, teach that, con uh, that ultrasound should be not a separate examination, but continuation of clinical examination by technical means. And that is what we do in Germany. And that is what you do as family physicians and general practices if you use ultrasound in daily clinical practice. You perform ultrasound as part of your clinical examination. And you know that clinical ultrasound has two sides of be part of one coin. And one is comprehensive multiparametric ultrasound. Um, Paul C2 has, um, yeah, has invented this, this uh, concept and uh, this um, term. And this is high-end ultrasound with expensive machines on top. And this is on par with other state-of-the-art imaging modalities and can be a valuable problem-solving tool in the hands of experts if, for example, CT and MRI don't give the right answers. But it costs time, it costs money, it is related to special expertise, has a flat learning curve and is not always and at each place available. Point of care ultrasound as the other type of clinical ultrasound focuses on simple clinical questions. It is on the lower end of prices, of time investment, and it opens the door to the democratization of ultrasound because it can be performed using small handheld ultrasound systems uh, at any place, any time, and by anyone who is trained in this uh, techniques. And therefore, it is inexpensive, widely available, and easy to use and fast to use. Um, what is fascinating about this concept is that ultrasound is directly involved in the doctor-patient interaction. And using, using handheld systems, it has the potential to bring together a factual objectivation of disease with interpersonal encounter between the physician and his patients. When you look to large CT and MRI machines, then you will always have a distance between the general practitioner or family physician and his patient. And this may, in the worst case, lead to roundabouts and in some cases to dead ends. But the small ultrasound device in the hand of you, of the family physician, general practitioner, becomes a bridge, a technical bridge between you and your patients. It promotes communication. You tell the patient what you see. He asks you, what is it, this on the screen? It creates by that closeness and becomes like a seventh sense of the physician. And therefore, I think that Focus using handheld ultrasound systems in particular is a technique very close to the human being, to your patients, which ideally substitutes the distance tube situation of large scale cross sectional imaging devices by a diagnostic interpersonal encounter situation. And this allows B directional dynamic information transfer. And so clinical ultrasound, especially focus in the hands of the uh, general practitioners and family physicians becomes a dialogic diagnostic modality. But this applies not only to diagnosis. You know that a number of simple therapeutic interventions can be performed and can be monitored with a focus concept, for example, by you, GPs, FPs, or by palliative care physicians, not only in the office of office at home, but also during home visits uh, when you visit when you visit your patients. And focus significantly may enhance the ability of GPs and family physicians to take rapid and immediate therapeutic action independent independent of diagnostic providers and specialists who are relatively distant from the patient. And this, and I think this is very important, strengthens the patient's trust in you, in, your, in, in, in their doctors who lends a hand very directly. And by that 
alleviate symptoms and suffering of your patients. Um, to give you an impression, I found some numbers on the market of handheld ultrasound devices, and you can see that the annual grow rate for handheld systems uh, is much higher than compared to um, all card-based systems. Uh, the high-end machines, premium card systems, have a grow which is expected to be until 2025 by around 3%, whereas handheld, the system market is growing by 20 to 30% a year until the year 2025. And these data are from the last year. Of course, handheld devices are not so expensive and therefore uh, the, the amount of money paid for these systems is lower compared to the premium systems. But this is the most growing sector of the ultrasound market at this time. This is another uh, diagram showing the, 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 the sharp increase of uh, the payments and the, the, the marketing of handheld ultrasound systems. And these systems have cost of only 2,500 to maybe 4,500 euros. There are some also for 10,000 or 20,000, but you don't need such expensive systems. And therefore, in my opinion, it is hard to imagine that in five years, in the year 2027, a general practitioner or family physician will not have such a device in his or her medical kit and use it as a naturally as his or her stethoscope or perhaps in place of it in some instances. And more even specialized non-physician healthcare providers, for example, uh, palliative nurses, family nurses, can with a brief and focused training be able to make simple yes or no diagnosis with these handheld devices, for example, looking for ascites or plural effusion or incomplete bladder emptying and even perform simple intervention to uh, deal with these situations, ascites, plural effusion, and so on, uh, with such devices. And therefore, ultrasound then no longer remains a specialist method, no longer a hospital method, but becomes a real home um, treatment device to be used not only by family physicians and palliative care physicians, but also by midwives, community nurse and palliative care nurses. And you know, the slogan, seeing is believing. And therefore, ultrasound guidance in your hand, in your hand of your uh, nurses, your specialist and trained nurses can facilitate the performance of several basic uh, ultrasound guided um, interventions. I will give you some basic information. And the most important is that for these uh, simple bedside interventions, you need no special equipment, for example, such a perforated biopsy probe, which has a cost of maybe 10,000 or 15,000 euros. You don't need image fusion. You don't need uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound. It may be helpful, but the central systems is up to now not available. Uh, you need only your simple handheld ultrasound probe and nearly all uh, interventions can be performed freehand without any special equipment. Some general principles. If you perform ultrasound guided um, interventions by that freehand technique without any attachment and without any special uh, probe, then you have the choice between the long axis approach. That means that the needle or the device comes in the long axis of the transducer or the short axis um, um, approach. Here you can see only the transverse section of the needle and you have to follow the needle its way into the target lesion. This is also called out of plane whereas the long axis approach is called the in plane approach. There are problems with both approaches. The problem of short axis is I already mentioned that if you um, comes with a needle, 
then you will have only a short moment or a small area which you can see in which you can see the needle tip or the course of the needle. If you want to be always in the situation to follow the needle at the tip of the needle, you have to change the direction of the transducer uh, while advancing the needle. And this needs some training. Um, okay, I think, yeah, this is a small video. And you can see that you can see the needle tip only if you are directly below the transducer, if you use this short axis or out of plane approach. Only this short moment, if you not sweep with, uh, the, with the transducer, as is, is shown here, that means you have to follow the needle tip while advancing uh, the needle into, in, in this case, into a vessel. This needs some training. And um, with a long axis approach, you have a problem that you have to choose the right angulation of the needle. Um, you have to be in the long axis of the uh, transducer and you have to target, for example, uh, a, a vessel which is two or three centimeters below the uh, surface of the body, then you have to choose to approximate the right angle. You can correct, of course, and this also needs some, um, some, some, some training. Yeah, here you can see in this animation that if you are not in the axis of the long axis of the transducer, then you will lose control. A visual control over the needle. This is one point. And the second point is you need the right angulation of the needle in relation to the target and in relation to the, um, to the probe. My first um, yeah, application is uh, to give you some facts on ultrasound guided peripheral venous access. Of course, in most situations, it is very easy to perform blood sampling or insertion of an indwelling peripheral venous cannula. But there are patients, you will know them, in, in, in which there is no vein to be found. And uh, then it is very time consuming and innovating and can cause both pain and psych psychological distress to the patients. And in the vast majority of these cases, these difficult cases, uh, you can use a handheld focus device and will succeed in detecting a suitable vein by means of ultrasound. And of course, what you can see, you can approach, you can target it, you can puncture it under direct ultrasound vision with an appropriate needle or indwelling in cannula. And this is indeed recommended in guidelines because numerous studies, including meta-analysis in adults and in children, have demo demonstrated the high efficacy and safety of this approach. And uh, moreover, you are able to look for an indwelling venous cannula for complications, for example, as thrombosis or infection, if you have a clinical suspicion that there is something going wrong with your indwelling needle. And again, nurses and other non-physician care providers are able to achieve competence in ultrasound guided venous access, which is shown, have been shown in several good uh, studies. I will show you one example. I did it yesterday. This is the artery. This is a vein. And uh, the vein is maybe eight millimeters beyond, uh, below the surface, and it is relatively easy. Here, the needle comes from the right to advance an indwelling cannula uh, into the small uh, vein. This is, you can see it now. I withdraw the uh, mandrang, and um, you can use um, a vial of, of, of uh, saline to prove that there is a correct position of uh, the, the indwelling cannula in the vein. This uh, color-coded signal comes from injection of water or saline into the vein. That is proof of correct function. 
You can do it also, this was long axis approach. You can do it also the other way around. This is short axis approach. I prefer the long axis approach. There are only, I think, two studies comparing this and uh, it was both effective. Here it is shown with a short axis access, but, but I prefer the long axis. It is easier in my hands, maybe that in your hands, this is a difference. Um, this uh, short axis um, um, access is used mainly in central venous access as shown here in the, um, in the jugular vein. You can compress the vein, here is the carotid artery, and you can puncture this large vessel. It is the difference to peripheral vessels with a small cannula in the short axis and then advance a guide wire and then the catheter. It's a little bit different situation to the peripheral axis. Yeah, you can see here the central axis with a sharp cannula and then insertion of a guide wire. Here it comes. And if you have a guide wire inside, you can uh, put some catheters into this vessel. But I think this is not a simple bedside intervention at home of the patient, but it was shown only for comparison. And this may be interesting for some of you, which are friends of new techniques. And I know that Paul Sido uh, have asked some vendors of ultrasound machines why they don't sell such technique up to now because it makes working with needles easier. You have not to turn your head to the uh, screen of an iPhone or another smartphone or a tablet. Using such smart glasses, virtual reality glasses, you can look at your target, at the patient of the arm of the target, for example, and then advance the needle and you will see it uh, in your virtual reality glasses parallel to the uh, situation at the surface of the patient. I think this is impressive. It works in this uh, prospective comparative study. It worked not as well as the traditional approach, but I think this is a matter of training. Um, I never use such a virtual glass. And uh, if you have some training, for example, with, with, with video games also, I think you will become also in a clinical situation familiar with this, with this, with this technique. Uh, there are several meta-analyses showing that the ultrasound guided, focus guided approach to peripheral venous access is successful. This is the newest one, I think. And you see that there are two randomized studies and uh, I think four or five other studies, comparative studies showing that there is an important advantage of uh, ultrasound guided access in difficult um, venous access situations. And that means it is proven that this approach in difficult venous access situation saves nerves, your nerves, the nerves of the patient and improves success rate. And moreover, it is more economical because you have a lower number of attempts. This is shown in the meta-analysis, mean one exempt, uh, one, uh, only one exempt, uh, one attempt um, uh, fewer than in um, the tra tra traditional approach, but it is a painful attempt. And therefore one, uh, to, to have one attempt a few, fewer attempt, it may help the patient and you. And it is uh, faster. You can save nearly five minutes by using ultrasound to get venous access in the periphery in difficult situations. And it is more convenient because patients love ultrasound guidance. It is shown here in three studies in which the patients have been asked if they prefer ultrasound guidance. They have all the same very impressive results, they much more like this done by ultrasound for several reasons. And therefore, our FSOM guideline said that real-time ultrasound guidance should be considered for peripheral venous access in cases with difficult conditions for cannulation and also uh, to detect 
direct complications of vascular excess. I show you only one example. This is a small thrombosis after um, uh, positioning of an indwelling cannula. You can see here the free left lumen and here the thrombus. Um, only a few words, maybe that you can perform that also in several situations. If, for example, the patient was in hospital, had a percutaneous or peripheral vascular intervention and now has pain in his groin. And there was an insertion of the catheter for catheter intervention. And you uh, take out your handheld device, device and see such a situation, a pseudoaneurysm of the groin. This is very characteristic. This is a feeding vessel, the femoral artery in this case, and this is a pseudoaneurysm. And if you perform uh, P, uh, PW Doppler, the pulse wave Doppler, then you can see this in a to and fro type waveform, which is very typical. The patient has pain, and uh, if you uh, if you don't do uh, anything, in some cases there will be complications like infection or perforation in very severe cases. And intervention is very simple. In these cases, you need only your transducer and a small needle. So this is one example in a 83 years old polymorbid patient four weeks after percutaneous intervention on and he was on dual platelet inhibition. And you see here the uh, common femoral artery with this short communication and a very large pseudoaneurysm with this to and fro, fro flow inside and outside the pseudoaneurysm with this characteristic uh, pulse wave Doppler signal. Uh, you will know that some of the uh, newer handheld devices have a pulse wave Doppler inside, but you don't need pulse wave Doppler, you need only uh, color-coded imaging. And uh, we took a needle, put it into, uh, here is a needle tip, into this large aneurysm near the neck in the inflow direction and injected thrombine solution, which is available. And after one minute, you see the result. There is no flow anymore in the pseudoaneurysm, which is now an hematoma. And if you disinfect properly, then the patient will not have infection. Some words on the role of interventions guided by handheld focus devices in palliative care, because I think this is very, very important. These patients are very sick. Uh, they have no much time left in their life. They don't want to go to hospitals or to radiologists in the practice and to wait for uh, examinations and to wait for the reports and they want to have the palliative care physician or the, uh, family physician caring immediately in at their home uh, to provide help if they need. And we performed an, um, yeah, a pilot study, I would say, um, with nine emergency physicians with five general practitioners, six, six uh, uh, palliative care physicians and five palliative care nurses. Uh, they got a uh, very simple handheld ultrasound device, uh, had two weeks of independent and accompanied training, two days of hands-on and the rest, uh, the rest of the time only supervision and then went into the study. And you see that in this prospective study of the outpatient use of handheld ultrasound, um, we had 427 examinations done with complete questionnaires from 364 patients and you see uh, the most important findings were plural effusion. This is GPs and ascites by the palliative care nurses, ascites and plural effusion, of course, also hydronephrosis and some other findings. But effusions were on the forefront. And this was also true for the palliative care physicians. And uh, in our study, we found that these 
very simple findings with a very short information, uh, with a very short examination, influenced further patient management in 80% of cases. And this is important for my topic now. It initiated intervention like paracentesis or or thesis or categorization, bladder categorization in 20% of patients. And this was directly done in the same session in 10% in half of the intervention cases. In the other cases, this was done next day, for example, when a palliative care nurse found an effusion, then the palliative care physician next day performed uh, the thoracosynthesis or paracentesis. And there, I now uh, would like to tell you something on POCUS guided paracentesis and thoracocentesis. And um, I will summarize that POCUS guidance is, of course, very useful to avoid accidental puncture of intraabdominal organs and vascular structures. If you have a palliative patient, he may have several reasons for a distended abdomen. And to prove that there is really a situs and not a ileus uh, will help you a lot to make a safe and, uh, and effective um, acetous drainage. You can optimize this with a sick abdominal valve or in patients with liver cirrhosis with a recanalized uh, umbilical vein or other collateral vessels in the abdominal uh, wall. And therefore, uh, again, guidelines rec recommend that paracentesis, thoracocentesis, and pericardiocentesis should only be, be performed under ultrasound assistance or better uh, guidance. And very important is that these procedures can be done safely also in patients with coagulation disorders and anti and on anticoagulants or antiplatelet drugs. Of course, you have to localize the pleural effusion, which is easy done with a handheld device. You have to look for internal structures, for example, septae or chambering uh, of these uh, of these effusion, which may cause difficulties and need another approach. And you can. Um, uh, measure the effusion and find the most appropriate place for the needle and guide your puncture. And in this case, this was not a large uh, uh, plural effusion, and this was only a diagnostic procedure. And you see that I have performed it in the long axis approach, which is very easy, and then we aspirate a little bit of the fluid and send it wherever we want to cytology, to uh, the biochemical examinations in our lab uh, or in your lab, and if necessary, also to microbiological analysis. And you know, for example, the light criteria for plural effusions, there are similar criteria for ascites, which are very, very helpful also to differentiate not only between infection and non-infection, but also between an benign or a malignant uh, effusion. You can use, for example, cholesterol as a marker or fibronectin or tumor markers like uh, carcinoembryonal antigen. This is very easy. And you see with these uh, small films, it is easy also in very small effusions of uh, the abdominal cavity in this case. And of the plural, you have complete control over the needle tip and um, this is easy and it is safe, in my opinion. Yeah? You have only to choose the right direction, not to go into these structures if you come from the right side. Uh, and then it is very easy. And if you need uh, drainage, you can use, for example, these nice uh, needles, which are in, have been invented by my colleague, Professor Schlottmann from Germany. This is a six, six French Teflon tube with side holes with different uh, lengths for plural and acetus and with a high flow rate and a low price. But you can also use an indwelling cannula for peripheral venous excess, which is also good. Here you see the needle in action. And you can use, for example, also very simple universal drainages for this approach. And 
uh, of course, you can use ultrasound also to look if there's any complication. And an, an important complication in this case would be uh, pneumothorax. And you see the difference. This was the, uh, the site without puncture. You see lung sliding. And here you see uh, only the plural line and total reflection at this line and um, uh, reverberation echo. And this, there's no lung sliding. And this is the typical sign of a pneumothorax, which is uh, easily to be diagnosed. And the same is this paracentesis. You can look for the most safe place for the uh, puncture. And of course, you can use anesthesia, local anesthesia, if you will uh, insert a larger cannula. Uh, but if you have performed only a, a, a diagnostic um, puncture, you will not need any um, any local anesthesia, and then you can send it to the lab or substitute albumin if there is insertion of an um, indwelling cannula. I will show you not the complete film. Um, sometimes there are complications. There was no vessel to be seen, but you see bleeding after paracentesis, better with color-coded duplex. This is unusual. I have only this one film. It was impressive. And I what was a little bit anxious for the patient with liver cirrhosis and very low platelets. But uh, one minute later, there was only a little bit bleeding. And then the bleeding stopped. And there are very good data with a large number of patients showing that uh, toracocentesis and also paracentesis is a very safe procedure. Uh, also in patients with uh, high ENR, higher than 3.0, and also in patients with platelets below 100,000. And there were no real complications in these patients independently from international normalized ratio. And the same was true in another st study uh, with um, uh, where is paracentesis? One is paracentesis. I think it was a mistake in one of the slides. And in this study, it was shown that uh, if you substitute platelets or, or, or coagulation factors, it will not reduce the complication rate because bleeding rate in the group without correction in patients with impaired coagulation um, was zero and bleeding in the correction group was, was 1%, which is no different, but you don't need uh, correction. And here's a, a slide for paracentesis. Bleeding risk was 1%. Three patients of 300 needed blood transfusion. That means that also in these patients with the platelet count be below 50,000, is and you need you don't need routine assessment of the pre-procedural serum platelets or of uh, coagulation parameters. Um, okay, um, I have very short topics only to remember you that you can use POCUS to guide, for example, bladder categorization. Uh, of course, here you see a correct placement of the catheter with the catheter balloon. If they are, this is very rare, but may occur if there are difficulties, for example, to remove this catheter because the channel is blocked, then you have the option, uh, for example, to go here with a very thin needle and to um, remove the fluid from the balloon. This is also described in case uh, stories I did one time. It is a rare situation. And here you see a misplacement of the catheter within the prostate. And you know you have to deflate the balloon and to insert a new urinary catheter to, um, to, to drain this, um, uh, this bladder. You can also use uh, ultrasound for insertion of nasogastric tubes. Yesterday, I tried to make a film, but I was not able to swallow uh, the nasogastric tube um, myself. And I wanted not to no patient with an indication. I was not able to make a film because I was not tough enough 
to place myself in as a gastric tube, but it is possible and has been shown. And here you can see that there is correct positioning. Here's the esophagus. Uh, here's a little bit air inside uh, after inflation of the nasogastric tube. And there are uh, data. This is a prospective randomized study showing that with focus guidance, the success rate is a little bit higher than with uh, with um, the traditional approach without guidance, 10% higher. And it was possible in this study with 120 patients in 95 cases uh, to insert, as in my own experience with me as a patient, uh, uh, on um, this, this guidance by uh, ultrasound visualization. And of course, if you want to perform bedside interventions and you have no um, experience with that, need some training and this is a step up approach with starting with diagnostic ultrasound. Uh, this may be restricted only to POCUS, then uh, targeted exercises using simulators and fans, fans on, and then hands-on training uh, with patients. And the first step is journals or webinars or learning. You can go to the um, website of some. There's a chapter of the European course book on interventional ultrasound. There's also the book of Professor Dietrich and Professor Nunberg on interventional ultrasound in English and in German language, also including focus interventions. And the second step should be hand on training on phantoms. And I can invite you for 2024 in April again uh, to our Stephens Eurozone School in Interventional Ultrasound and there you have the chance for training but you will have other uh, opportunities in your own countries. Uh, simulation based learning is very attractive for these um, for these um, focus interventions and you see that is the traditional uh, approach. Senior residents have uh, moderately good success rates in, in, in vascular access. But if a junior resident starts his training, of course, his success rate is uh, below. But after an intervention, and intervention was a mixture of an, uh, curricular learning, that means lectures and uh, seminars, plus e-learning, plus simulation-based learnings and tends on on models or phantoms uh, with uh, regard to vascular access and pleural access and uh, abdominal access. This very fast improved to nearly 100% success. These two numbers show uh, the out of plane and the in plane approach. And you see that uh, in this study, the in plane approach works a little bit better than the out of plane. Um, approach here, you see some pictures from train interventional ultrasound uh, in this year in April. Here with uh, a vascular access phantom from, from the Blue Phantom Company. I think it costs about around um, 800 euros. This was my own experience. And of course, you will have these situations like me 20 years ago that you have no success, it will not work as you want, but uh, believe in you, believe in your teachers, and you will have your own uh, learning curve to success. And I invite you, this is my last slide, to Eurozone 2023, together with the Congress President Maya Rajina from Latvia, come to Riga next year. We will have also focus sessions and, of course, sessions for uh, family physicians and general practitioners. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Christian Janssen, for your nice presentation. And we expect you to come in here in Vienna. And I think then uh, our uh, colleagues will put you the questions because I'm, I know you are in hurry now. <laughs> yes, and, <sir>. uh, <laughs> please go to catch the, the plane <laughs> and uh, come together with us. Thank you very much. And to, uh, tomorrow, we'll put the, uh, the question for you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Have Goodbye. A,
Thank you.